Okay, let me get my notes again. All right, that was the end of our panels for today. Um, and we have a, now have a few quick administrative matters to turn to, and then we'll take talk about the substance of today's meeting. Uh, we'll begin with a quick administrative item to approve the minutes from the June 23 meeting. Uh, can somebody, uh, I'll move for it. Can somebody second moving, uh, approving the minutes? Second. Any opposed? All right, the meeting, the minutes are approved. Um, next, I wanna have a data update. Um, we completed, a, everybody should know. So as I alluded to earlier today, uh, data collection and, and building a database, which we hope will both be helpful to our committee, the governor's office, the legislature, and eventually to the public. Um, it's something, a long-term project that we have been working on. And by we, I mean uh, Tom and the staff particularly, um, you know, since day one. And we've been making great progress. And we had a particularly important milestone uh, recently in that we've reached a final agreement with Los Angeles District Attorney's Office to share data with them going back how far, Tom? Uh, quite a while, I think, um, before the turn of the century. All right. So as many of you know, LA County is the largest jurisdiction in the country. And the local data from LA will add to the data set we've been compiling from the State Department of Justice and CDCR. This agreement was in a long time in the making, and I wanted to thank our staff and the folks in LA who helped make it possible. I'm really excited about this work, and I know the folks that... Um, California Policy Lab have also been working hard on this. This is something that I hope we'll have more developments on in the months to come. Uh, now, two updates from Tom, one on the status of the legislation that we proposed uh, last year and the other about uh, crime data in California. Yes, these will be very quick. So, um, you know, we're in that part of the year where uh, folks are waiting to see what's gonna, what the governor is gonna do with bills that are on his desk. And there are four that are pending. You can see the list here, including uh, one from Senator Skinner, uh, SB81, and one from some member, Brian, AB60, uh, to see uh, you know what action the governor will take. So um, hopefully we'll get positive results on these. Uh, AB600 is one that would allow judges to resentence people if the law has changed, but only be the judge had the power to do it. Um, and then there's another one that's also on judicial empowerment of license in addition to the parole and restorative justice uh, ones that uh, are uh, Senator Skinner and Assemblymember member Bryan's. Um, so we'll see how those turn out. And then I also wanted to update everyone on violent crime data for 2023 so far. So this is very similar to the update that I gave at our uh, last meeting in June. We're able to look at what's happening in the largest cities in California, the eight largest cities, including uh and then in addition to that, areas patrolled by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. This is data that those departments report to an organization called the Major City Chiefs Association. So it's directly from the police departments. And this takes us through the first half of the year. And we can see that overall violent crime is down 4% in those cities with a particularly big drop in homicide and uh, rape as well, but down in all categories. Um, violent crime overall has dropped a little bit more in cities outside of California, but just by about half a percentage, our homicide drop was bigger, as was our uh, drop in reported rapes as well. And if you look at just the um, cities that are in LA, which is you know Los Angeles, Long Beach, and the Sheriff's Department jurisdictions, we see violent crime is overall down uh, even bigger there than the rest of the state. The exceptions to this in the data are Oakland, where violent crime is up in every category, and Long Beach, which is also up in some categories as well. But when you take all those together, we're seeing a, a great trend. Uh, you know, and this is not, you know, as this shows, it's not just limited to California. And I've seen some analysis that says the drop in homicide this year might be the largest drop in uh, U.S. history, uh, percentage-wise. So um, good uh, signs of what is coming. And hopefully this will take us back to the levels we were pre-COVID, and in a, in a, you know, eventually. So that's the legislative and the violent crime. Um, and Rick, or, uh, Mike, we could get well, into the, before, this, sorry, yes, Senator Scott. Um, before you go on, I mean, the shame of all this is, here's this data you're showing us, and yet the public perception is way, way off. I mean, the public perception is that crime is up and, <clears throat> and you know so i i don't know what we do about that um but yeah that's what that's the public reality we're facing and political reality. yeah and that's that's fueled by the smash and grabs and the closing of department stores I mean, yes. I get all the headlines now yeah 
So I, I agree. We run into this a ton and it's something that, you know, I think that we need to think of a committee is what is our responsibility in terms of that public narrative, obviously reporting accurate data we've taken on. Um, I think that there's ways that we could be a little bit more public about that. As I um, alluded to with regard to the uh, cor uh, incarceration <laughs> data that we've been getting from other um, yeah. LA County and elsewhere, we hope to build a public facing website to reveal some of that information. That's not necessarily crime rate information, but it's something that we should consider. This is currently a publicly available data that's out there. We just happen to compile it in a certain way. Um, I agree that it's not um, breaking through. Robberies account for a large percentage of those smash and grab crimes that are headline grabbing, and yet they are down um, throughout California, particularly in LA County, and all, actually all across the country. So I think we need to keep on saying that, telling the relevant policymakers that that it happens to be the case. Um, and it's something that we need to, I guess, continue to work on and think about as a committee, how we can perhaps or should um, help make sure that accurate information is out there. I think one of the big problems that we have in California is that the crime rate data that's published by the official state crime rate data is usually tied to the uh, attorney general's report, which comes out, uh, you know, a year to two, you know, 18 months after the fact. Um, so it's quite late and, and I don't think particularly helpful. So in any event, if folks have thoughts about that, I mean, we can talk about it here or um, offline. Please let me know. It's, you know, it's a conversation, it's, you know, it's evergreen in a lot of ways. But we should know to the extent that we're a policy um, development uh, arm of the government, um, that there is good news here in terms of violent crime data in California. You know, the, the last thing I'd mention related to this is, you know, as of yesterday, the new um, bail schedule in Los Angeles went into effect that, you know, has the potential to be quite significant. Uh, and LAPD reports crime, reports crime weekly, and I've been keeping an eye on that to see, um, you know, what can be said about that. So I'll try to report back on that as well. But it looks like, you know, violent crime is continuing to go down in LA and they report property crime as well, which is also um, down a little bit overall, while arrests have gone up quite significantly. So, um, you know, maybe we'll have a little bit more info on LA next time we, we see each other given the bail situation there. And this is something that we have decided to take on as part of responsibility of the committee to disseminating this kind of crime information. Um, and we may, anyway, I would love the input from committee members as to if we should spend more time, less time, and resources on tracking this. But uh, I think it is particularly important. It does, as uh, Senator Skinner mentioned, um, drive a lot of the policy that we have in the state and, off, and often ways that are counter to the actual data. All right. And of um, course, any discussions would comply with the open meeting laws, Mike. So we, you know, we would we do that for sure. That goes without saying. Otherwise, I don't. I don't want to end up as a crime statistic. <laughs> we'll have to start tracking that one. That's not in the usual uh, reports. Okay, so uh, let's move on to discussion of what we heard this morning and this afternoon. Um, you know, I I thought it would be helpful just to sort of uh, key up um, and put together the recommendations from staff for discussion that were in the memo. Um, so that's what we'll go through here very briefly, and we'll start. Um, sort of where we just ended around prosecutorial discretion and incentives and things like that. So the way we thought about this, um, you know, sort of looking at the, the history that we just sort of spent um, a lot of time going over is there's kind of two ways to talk, think about incentives. One is you require payment or you, um, you reward by paying for certain behavior. And it seemed like the natural place to begin discussion would be requiring counties to pay to use prison in some circumstances. And Maybe we can start talking about it in the around short sentences, which you know the data we have shows it's it's more than ten thousand people a year go to CDCR for less than a year, so it's a significant amount of people. You know that's two or three prisons worth of people, depending upon how you you think about it. And of course, those first days in prison are the most expensive and sort of the least helpful because you're sitting in a reception center where not much is happening um, programming wise. So that's right. sort of 
yeah. Can I just reiterate that point because I think it's an extraordinary one, and it's something that I remember talking with the governor's office even before this committee got founded, which is at least thirty percent, and it may be closer to forty percent of everybody who enters CDCR in a given year is spends less than one year at CDCR, and a good percentage of that people are there for less than six months. It is a huge number. It's a problem. Everybody knows it within CDCR. It's an extraordinary amount of money. They're, we're, uh, they're most expensive people because of the intake and all the different evaluations that need to go into it. But perhaps most importantly of all, and this gets to Mia Bird's study, it actually increases recidivism to send people to prison for these crimes rather than keep them at, in jail locally. I think that this is an exact area that we as a committee can weigh in on in ways we can reduce reliance on at least state incarceration and improve public safety at the same time. Whether or not we do this through some sort of incentive program that we've been discussing or not, I, I just think it's something that we should really focus on. That's sort of part one is, you know, requiring payment. And the second piece is giving out money. Um, and I think uh, what we heard this morning about sort of the evidence we're starting to get around actually less prosecution is better for public safety and employment numbers too, which, which weren't really emphasized, but folks were almost 50% higher to be employed, you know, uh, in the time period examined too. So great outcomes across the board, rewarding prosecutors for doing that. And as some member, Brian, I think to your point, you know, there's a contrast we could strike between the way realignment kind of handled this and the way I think SB 678 handled it, which was, when do you give the money? Do you give it in advance of what you want folks to do, or do you want reward them once they've done it? And it seems like that latter approach might address some of those um, concerns, which I think particularly around charging practices um, are really salient, to use the word of the day that we heard a lot. Um, uh, you know, you don't want prosecutors to say, well, we're dismissing more cases because we charged twice as many people, and then we threw those cases out. I mean, it'd be very easy to sort of imagine widening the net here a little bit. Um, so I think part of this, you'd want to say, you know, there does have to be some kind of baseline. You don't want to you know, be able to um, increase your numbers a little bit. And I don't think both of these things have to go together. I, I think there could be a proposal that could just be part one or it could just be part two. I think they are um, severable, as lawyers like to say. Um, so that, that might be a part of it. And then the, the other piece of this too um, is to sort of create a clear channel in the penal code for deferral and automatic dismissal of prosecution. So this might be something that goes into something you reward counties for doing. Like if you are uh, deferring more cases than you did in a way that enhances public safety, that's something that you can get support for. Because what we heard speaking to prosecutors about some of these ideas is, you know, a lot of folks are interested in this stuff. But they don't know where to start. They don't have the, the funding for, they don't sort of know where to go. So support from the state, even if it wasn't, you know, um, sort of uh, requiring payment for anything might actually move the needle um, a little bit. And so a penal code section that says, look, you know, this case is kind of on the margin a little bit, we're going to charge you, but if you don't get arrested for six months or 12 months, the case is going to be automatically dismissed and sealed. You don't have to come to court. You don't have to do anything. And this case gets taken care of. Uh, it seems like it would be similar to what was uh, in some of the studies we heard about this morning and based on a, you know, um, a procedure that exists in, in New York City right now that is used quite commonly. Uh, it would be a good way to sort of create something that could be measured and, and part of this incentive program. So that's how we thought about the incentives. Um, there's sort of, you know, building blocks. You could do them all, you could do pieces of them, but it seems like we've got good evidence that they have the intended effect though. Um, there's always, of course, subtext as Senator Skinner pointed out to some of these things. And they actually do seem to be a way to encourage different use of discretion without imposing it from on high, which is, you know, we saw in the Prop 8 experience um, will not be ultimately successful. So I thought maybe we want to pause there and discuss, or I could continue on uh, to the guilty plea uh, specific ideas. Yeah, I think at that that last point, Thomas, I know that that I mean, that's what happened to the Dodger pitcher Urias. He was arrested for DV. Said if you're okay for uh, two years, whatever, uh, no charges will be filed. I don't right. even think the charges were filed, but then he alleged to have committed kind of a similar offense again, and now. He's going to face charges, we think. Mm -hmm. So I think in practice, maybe at least the LADA's office is doing something just like that already. But you're saying we may need to include a penal code provision that allows for that. Yeah. And I think the automatic uh, dismissal and sealing, um, you know, 
you're describing a situation it sounds like charges weren't brought he probably had a lawyer who was able to negotiate yeah. something unusual i'm not i don't know but um having a way that's automatic so so everyone in the system kind of knows what to expect and how it work yeah. uh, particularly if it's tied to an incentive to use it in lieu of the traditional process i think um is a good package because so otherwise i think we do have these net widening effects of you know i'm going to charge more cases that were on the margin before i'm going to do the opposite of what professor doliak suggested and sort of lean away from leniency if you know um uh the dismissal will will sort of happen automatically and this also does tie dismissals a little bit more to public safety instead of it being sort of a you know a gut or you know sort of a reasoned instinct from prosecutors actually says look if you demonstrate um which i know is problematic in some degree but if you aren't arrested again that sort of seems to be a good indication for public safety that you don't need to be prosecuted for some of these offenses well what we'd like to do is, is figure out a you know if we should continue to write these up. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm a little bit, I don't see how the second bullet, I mean, it could be in package with an incentive program, but almost everything that we suggest could be packaged with an incentive program. We didn't hear much today about the idea of a new penal code section that said that was this automatic deferral and dismissal. Um, well, I think that's what uh, Professor Doliak was de describing. That was her sort of um, recommendation was to make that easier, ad administratively easy as possible. But you're right. It, it wasn't, you know, a subject of uh, uh, extensive so discussion. Removing a bureaucratic hurdle to dismiss it. Right. Right. And do we have any suggestion that that is a sufficient hurdle, to, hurdle that would actually change practices? Well, I think that's why it is important to tie this one in particular um, to an incentive, because it'd be something that could be specifically tracked um, and you could use to uh, tie to a penal code section and to a, the reward for it instead of trying to track things a little more um, generically. That's why I think it makes sense to tie this one together. But, um, you know, they're... Uh, and, you know, another thing we heard from, you know, and this comes up when we talk about lead a little bit, too, is that I think folks on the law enforcement side like to have clear guide rails and there's different comfort levels with operating and the sort of ambiguity of if it's not forbidden, perhaps we can devote. Whereas if something specifically authorized, it gives it a little uh, wind beneath its wings. Listen, I, I think this is interesting, but of the things that we've discussed with related to incentives at least, I think the strongest is um, the short prison stays. Mm -hmm. And I know that we've made recommendations on short prison stays in the past, but I would investigate a, a, some program that said, um, well, I guess it's a question. Um, you could say, reduce the number of people you're sending to prison for one year, and in, in return, you get some financial incentives to invest in programs. Or we could just say um, counties shall never, sh you know, shall, shall not send people to CDCR with um, short prison stays mm -hmm. and they get um, financial benefits because they're taking on that cost. I guess I suppose I support the latter. Kind of a realignment plus. I was <laughs> trying to avoid like that. that term, but yes. Yeah. And I understand how that kind of incentivizes the county. The county will then be face a decision about whether or not to invest that money that they get into programming uh, versus more jail beds to cover the amount of people. So I understand how that would eventually push people in, in a de decarcerative way. Um, um, go ahead. I know this is not <clears throat> necessarily our charge, but um, you know we're reviewing the penal code and we're uh, identifying through the stakeholder participation and the data we're doing of where it's where it is either inefficient, impractical, or uh, doesn't 
doesn't produce the results that we um, for which it was intended. However, I'm looking at these kind of things of financial incentives and I go back to what I raised before, which is what I mean the financial incentive alone you'd think should be a motivation, but I don't um, I'm not confident it would be. So what kind of either um, research or you know focus type group or some, what how could we explore? What would make such financial incentives be attractive? Um, you know, off the top of my head, I'm thinking about most of the public does have a strong, they have a strong correlation between unhoused people and their perception of crime. They think the more unhoused people you have, the more crime you have. They also have a perception around uh, mental illness and, you know, un, un, when we don't provide the services or uh, appropriate care for those mentally ill, again, crime, it affects crime. And whether there can be any correlation between, you know, each each person you don't send to prison, you know, mm -hmm. we provide that amount to the county to house. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I'm being, I'm thinking out loud, but, uh, and obviously to make that practical would have to be significant dollar amounts. Um, but I'm just trying to think of what, what correlations, what ways do, do, would these incentives feel attractive and acceptable? Yeah, I think that kind of research would be really, um, instructive. Uh, I think that would take us sort of beyond the scope of, um, this year's report a little bit to be able to socialize it well with everybody but um you know it's worth it uh senator skinner i was wondering if so again i think prior to the formation of this committee i worked with senator bell on a bill that aimed to capture the number of, of pe mentally people who are men suffering from mental illness who were sent to state prison and as a state as a county reduced that number over time that they were then given um, additional resources from the state um, to provide treatment in the community. Is that something along closer to what you were suggesting or thinking about? You're on mute. You're on mute. Senator Skinner, you're on mute. I said for it to be meaningful, it'd have to be a large amount of money because for, mm -hmm. you know, whether we're, well, over time, a mental health bed is much less expensive than a state prison bed. And over time, a, uh, a housing unit for an unhoused person is less expensive than a state prison bed. The initial capital costs are as high, if not higher. Mm -hmm. So we so in other words, the marginal cost, the marginal savings that CDCR would would receive as a result of a reduction in mentally ill prisoners isn't high enough to give that money to the counties in a way that would be meaningful. Is that what you're saying? Potentially, yeah. So just I don't, I don't want to just write it off, but I mean, I don't, I don't know how this is budgeted, honestly. Is is the fairest way to do it to say to CDCR, what's your marginal cost for a mentally ill person? I mean, there the cost for a mentally ill person is higher. I mean, we, uh, and there the number is large, um, but the cost for people with a large medical need is also very high. I I understand. I'm just trying to chop off one piece that. Right. There's a, you know, we can get maybe get our arms around. And then I was going to ask Judge Espinoza, what's the number per person where it becomes to become starts to become meaningful on a cal on a county level? Sure. So, and I was looking for the hand raise button. I couldn't find it. <laughs> Shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, we the last time I checked in. And I still consult with the Department of Health Services, but I'm no longer the director of ODR. Right. Um, 
the average annual cost for care in the community, which includes everything, it was around $50,000, which is a bargain. Um, I don't know about startup costs, but you know we use uh, per community-based providers um, to create the housing and we use community-based providers to do the case management, provide the clinical services. And it is all much less expensive than a, a county jail bed. Um, there was a time when, when our uh, ability to expand the program was capped at 2,200 beds. Um, as a result of litigation around conditions in the jail, the county um, <clears throat> uh, gave ODR additional funds to expand their capacity to care for people in the community. And we're trying to ramp up over 3,000 beds in the next to 3,000 beds, up to 3,000 beds in the next year. In addition to that work, and that's our felony pretrial program, right? That's people coming out to us on probation, cared for in the community. We also have our FISP program, Felony Incompetent to Stand Trial Program, which is funded through the Department of State Hospitals, and the costs are similar. Um, they may so, be a so, so here's a question. Sorry to cut you off. So I don't know the answer because we could never get a straight answer as to what it costs to provide that housing and care in the jail. No, I understand. Okay. Not Do you think, and I know that this isn't, it's impossible to know that 20, if, if it's $50,000 all in to care for somebody for a year, is that the number? Yes. If the state were to say $25,000 new money, is that something that you think would incentivize Sarah? Los Angeles no. to build more beds or no, it has to be. No, and, and we, we currently, um, I don't want to overstep my knowledge here, but we currently have a good relationship with the department of state hospitals and have a contract with them for providing this care. Um, that is, that meets the needs of, you know, the state and the County. So, but $25,000, which would only require, would require the County to, to match that. And um, I, I don't know. I don't know if that would, I, I, I'm probably not the person to answer that question, Michael. Right, I guess it doesn't seem like it's strong. Yeah, I just know that our care is cheaper and more efficient. And, and our care is permanent supportive housing, right? So when people are no long, longer under an obligation to stay with us, either because their probation has expired or um, they're no longer fist, they're welcome to stay with us and we continue to care for them. Um, but the, the, the financial details of how of all of that works is, is really, um, above my pay grade. I just will say one thing about this idea of incentives and returning money to the County, like SB 678. I think the state needs to look again at how that money is distributed to the counties and who is in the decision-making, um, the role of decision maker and, and how the money is spent when it comes back to the county. Yeah, that that I think we know. That is the you know, decision makers at the uh, Department of Probation and that they have some latitude in the type of programs that they can invest them in. I guess what would be helpful to me, and this is a qu staff question really, is how did 678 determine the amount of money that was going to go back per person? And that was obviously enough to have a, a significant incentive effect at least in the probation department yeah yeah and it's and, phrased as a, a portion of the state of the savings so right i suspect you know it's there isn't necessarily a algorithm beneath it you know but there was some number that did yeah. go back what was that number and it did have the effect the desired intended effect i mean maybe we don't need in other words is um the savings is going to be Maybe it's not fifty thousand dollars per person, right? Um, or whatever happens done. It'd be interesting to know. Yeah, no, that's out there for sure. Okay. Well, it sounds like we should um, let this one bake a little bit longer, which I think makes sense given the the scope uh, of it and, and the number of questions that people have. That's what I'm. That's what I'm hearing. You know, that does not need to be the. Judge kind of place we land. Yeah, yeah. I, my offer to Tom and the staff is to put you in touch with the people who um, have the actual knowledge on cost and uh, for beds and care. So it's 
very easy for me to do. I, and let me say that in terms of tabling this, I'm kind of disappointed in the idea of tabling it uh, because let's just talk about 678 and uh, the juvenile justice realignment. Those had dramatic positive impacts in the, pol the policies that we wanted um, to implement. They were incredibly successful, I believe. Um, and I wish that we could try to figure out ways to, I think that, I think it needs more, I think certainly our proposal needs a little bit more thought and more refinement, but I would love to be able to come up with a proposal this year um, that learn from those, um, I think, success stories. And whether, whether it's, you know, something along the Senator Bell proposal, which is focusing on, um, you know, number of mentally ill people sent to state prison or the short timers, or some sort of discrete mechanism. I think it's almost like a little bit too amorphous at this stage. Assemblymember Brian. Yeah, no, I, I definitely see where you're going uh, with this, Mr. Chair, and I, I don't disagree with the the broader goals. And I, and I think we're balancing kind of the positive feels of six, seven, nine, and and literally avoiding AB one hundred nine at all costs, right? From conversation uh, in this presentation, um, and I think it, it's it's that that struggle. Um, that makes us maybe not worth tabling, but worth making sure that whatever recommendation comes from this committee is one that we feel is is rock solid uh, and not rooted in potential unintended consequences. And mm -hmm. I'm not convinced we can't get there. Um, can, I, can I just ask, what do you find is the primary problems with, with AB 109 and realignment? I mean, it reduced the prison population dramatically, reduced the number of people, total people incarcerated, um, significantly. I realize that there's a lot of money that went to the counties that has not been spent. Is that the main concern? Yes. I mean, also, we know that the, you know, the average stay in jails um, went up and jails were not, you know, jails were not meant for long-term stays, period. Um, it's, a, it's a terrible, and, and, the, and then the solution started to arise, well, then we need bigger, better jails. So let's just use this money to build, you know, better um, places to to house people for longer periods of time since our current jail infrastructure isn't sufficient. And so I, I just think it kind of opened the conversation to to shifting from one carcel look to another one. And then we got so stuck that now we're just sitting on a bunch of dollars in certain, particularly in the LA County Sheriff's Department. I, I'm mostly unfamiliar with LA situation. I, I they, agree that we're sitting on a bunch of money. My understanding is no new jails, no significant new jails have actually been built as a re result of real life. Like, you know, th thanks to uh, some significant organizing uh, no, that, that some folks did uh, some years ago, but LA was yeah. like, LA had signed a contract for three point six billion on uh, on the mm -hmm. on the state stack. And the the stay in jails are still the average stay in jails are still very low. And the average yeah. average stay in jail is there are some outliers. I agree of people spending a significant amount of time. And I would suggest that any bill that we would recommend that said short timers stay in jail, we the state prison should take on the long timers. Yeah, and, and, and to, to be fair, Mr. Chair, I think that's a good question too, right? Like what, let's un, unpack AB 109. What what are the lessons to be learned in both of these two instances where we've, we've created this incentive structure? I'm perfectly open to learning positive lessons uh, and adjusting my own you know, perception on on the, the good and bad of, of that approach. Um, but I just want to make sure that we we get this right, particularly if the dollars are just moving from state coffers to, you know, local jails and probation departments at a at a lesser, you know, expense than we're spending at the state level. I think that makes great state policy. I, I don't know if that promotes the entire community safety and wellness that we're we're wanting to promote. I yes, I agree. I want to push back just briefly on two things. First of all, I think that we could structure it in such a way so similar to 678 where the money is not just blank check. You could spend it on whatever you want. And I certainly would have reservations about building a new jail. However, even if it was built in a new jail, the data that we have say that the public safety outcomes are better when you serve your time locally rather. So if we're really worried about public safety, that's what I mean. So we're currently doing the worst of all worlds. Yeah. Right. We are spending more money sending them to the state and um, increasing crime. And so I, I guess it goes back to the kind of the root conversation about um, whether, because you're right, it's an investment in the state prison infrastructure versus 
a local investment in the jail infrastructure, better public safety outcome. And then the kind of school of thought I'm coming from is, is what about a proportional investment in some sort of other civic mm -hmm. or community infrastructures to promote but, public safety? And that's that's the trade off that that I grapple with. I'm a million percent on your on board. I'm just saying I, 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 I think we're on the same page. I think that we could I guess I guess what I'm sort of proposing and I guess it's not on the slide is short timers go to jail and in return counties get money that needs to be that can be spent in prescribed ways that we think are evidence based reducing crime improving overall public safety and not building new jails i think we're right on the same page in that in that regard particularly if those dollars are used you know for any kind of reentry or you know th things of that nature that are, that are not in the sole incarceration of that person at the local level versus the state level i think there's a lot of opportunity here and i think i think we'll get there All right and I do think that 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 it that includes the incentive idea because counties will be incentivized to in, to get more state money for those positive programs. The way that they get more money for those positive programs is sending fewer people um, to state prison. I think that makes sense to me. You know, the the other angle that I think would avoid some of those concerns, uh, some of the member Brian, is if you just looked at the prosecutorial charging piece and said, if you reduce, safely reduce the number of people you prosecute based on the research that's been done, there's a reward for that. So it would not even involve incarceration. You only get it if, you know, there's, we tighten up that filter about what gets into the system. So it's a little, only cases that are sort of necessarily need to be there, get there to some degree. Um, so it sort of just be the, again, the SB 678 model a little bit where there are rewards for particular, very clearly defined um, metrics that I think would then hopefully have a knock-on effect of reducing the, the folks that are in incarcerated ultimately. Um, that would be a way that would avoid some of these issues as well, perhaps. All right. For, so to, to move on to the next, unless anybody has any comments on this. Uh, I think one, one other comment. I I don't think we should drop this from our report because I think it's an important, we have good data on it and we have, I think we don't worry so much about trying to refine the exact proposal. I think it's more important in the report just to put that data out there about the costs and maybe even as we write the report, compare it to the cost of say a community-based mental health bed. Mm -hmm or a, uh, you know, the ongoing costs for uh, uh, on um, unhoused people bed, meaning permanent housing, uh, so that there's a, I mean, our reports are for more than just an immediate take up by the legislature for bills. It's it's also, you know, we're, we're trying to share for perpetuity what we've gathered and what we've learned. And so I think it needs to be in our report. And we need to worry less about exactly how we would propose the action to take. I, I agree with that. By our next meeting, I think that we can sort of go down three tracks on this incentive piece. First of all, let's find out some of the financial pieces that we're talking about. What are the costs of um, beds? How does 678 work in terms of how much money is being offered and how did they come up with that calculation? And then something along the lines that um, Assembly Member Brian and I were discussing. Um, just to give a little bit more concrete, while maintaining, I think, Senator Skinner's idea that whatever we come up with can and should lift up these um, success, I think that they're success stories in 678 and juvenile realignment um, to perhaps inspire others to figure out different ways um, to use those. Did you say three pieces, Mike? I counted two, but maybe I will. All right, I'll, I'll follow up with you later. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, then let's, so, well, are we saying a recommendation or not then? Or should we come up with some new category of presentation? In the let's report? not worry about that right now. But we don't need to make a decision of that today, but I do think, cause we, I know that our next meeting we're gonna have to approve. But we, I don't think we're, we're not, I don't think we're ready to make a recommendation here. Right. We boil it down a little bit more. And the recommendation may be as broad as 
what Senator Skinner was saying, we recommend legislation that capitalizes on some of these ideas and here are some metrics. That would be quite broad or it could be more specific along the lines that Senator, uh, Assembly Member Brian and I were discussing earlier. And also I'm open to kind of meeting, not in any violation of Bagley Keene, but with any handful of you to, to talk through any particulars of this before the next meeting, uh, if that would be helpful, of course. I'll take you up on that for sure. And, and I'll talk to your folks. <laughs> Okay, well, well, we'll have something in writing to review. Let's put it that way, and we can shape it further um, at the next uh, meeting. All right, so moving on to guilty pleas. So, um, you know, I, I think as came out during the discussion, these are very difficult issues um, and coming up with sort of a top down, like here's the solution to all the different problems that we talked about, because things don't cut in different ways. There are values that if you you try to privilege one, you're hurting another one. It's it's very hard to, to balance. So I I'm, can't say that we figured that out, but we did, we have identified four very targeted changes to the penal code uh, that we think would re remove some of the unfair pressures that people um, feel when pleading guilty that cause a guilty plea that are not fair in the interest of public safety. And it just sort of seem to um, exist for harshness sakes in a way. So we'll go through um, four of these uh, and then we can sort of, if you wanna interrupt with questions, feel free. We could sort of discuss as a group at the end. So just uh, speak as the spirit moves you. So the first has to do with the issue around pretrial incarceration and the tremendous amount of pressure that puts on people to plead guilty. So the proposal here is to allow um, a judge to revisit the bail conditions someone has whenever a plea offer is made, which would be particularly relevant if an offer is the time served or something close to it. So if the prosecutor says, you know, if you plead guilty today, we'll give you time served. You can walk out tomorrow. You can immediately go to the judge and say, this seems like a good time to talk about uh, my release conditions. The prosecutor indicates I don't seem to be a public safety risk anymore. And that should be, um, you know, seems like a really good reason for the judge to reconsider bail. So it would be uh, revising an existing penal code uh, section on when a court can revisit bail to say this would be an appropriate circumstance to do that. Muted, Mike. So I have a question about this. So this this seems to tie to the discovery issue that we we're talking about before. But I guess my question is, how often does it happen that you're offered a plea deal and then you sit on it and wait on it for a while, even if the deal the deal is to get out right away? Well, I, I think I, you don't. You would. I think yeah. It. That that's the concern is that maybe you should. Um, be able to, to process the deal, but you don't because you want to get out right away. Exactly. Okay. All right. This is a damn good recommendation, and I wish it was a better time to move it through the legislature because we should definitely still make it, and it should definitely get some some wind. But th this is this is this is brilliant in my opinion. This is one of my favorite things I heard all day. All day? Come on, give us more than that. I mean, I heard I heard a lot of great stuff, but this was one that I was like, that makes complete sense to me. You can explain this very easy. Right. Um, now, obviously, there are some concerns that time served office offers would disappear. I just don't think that would happen. Honestly, I don't think the system could really function, though. Maybe the judges are more cynical than, than me on that on that point. But, um, you know, uh, it, it just seems like a common sense approach to this issue. So I, I will just say, as a person who ran an early disposition court, high volume early disposition court towards the end of my career, there are time served offers made pretty frequently, but what's more common is offers are made um, for probation in lieu of state prison and in a, you know, a year in the county jail or 180 days in the county jail. Mm -hmm. And so that's slightly different. I still think this is a good recommendation, but I think we should consider some way to include that sort of offer um, and a reconsideration of release. But if if the DA says, well, look, even if he takes this offer and you let him out, he's going to have to go back into custody. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know how that would play out, but I, I think this is a good recommendation. I think, I think it would be any, any offer, uh, Judge Espinosa. So I think it would 
be most powerful in a time served. But I think it we could cover those circumstances you're, you're thinking then would become much more of a strategic decision by uh, the, the person in their, in their council. Okay. So, so is, is courts revisit pretrial detention? Is this something that we think happens kind of absent all parties and the judge just changes their, their mind? Or is this like another uh, bail hearing? It's not necessarily another bail hearing, but everybody's in the courtroom. Um, when, and it, and it can be very informal in some circumstances where the, the, the defense counsel just says, look, judge, um, my client needs time to think about this. And it could be something that the prosecutors will stipulate to as a temporary release while a decision is made um, on, on the offer. But if, if prosecutors, I don't know, there's some, there's some pitfalls here. Prosecutors see this as a way to, um, get someone released from custody and then announce ready for trial. I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know how hmm. any of that will play out, but I, again, I think this is a good recommendation. It's a way to reduce the pre-trial detention population. I'm just speaking about LA right now, which is a significant percentage of the population. You know, the last thing I'll say before uh, moving on, I'd emphasize this, or I think you could do this even if, without a plea offer, if you serve the maximum amount of time, you could serve as convicted, which I think doesn't happen too often, but, um, you know. Not in the felony, not in the felony. Right. I think this is really for lower level, you know, the kind of offenses where you're going to see time served offers. Um, but, you know, that seems to be even more appropriate than the um, You're offers. talking about misdemeanors? I think... Not necessarily limited to that, but that's probably where we'd see the most uh, use of something like that. So in our county, not that we are the only county to be considered, very few misdemeanors are in the L.A. County Jail because there's just no room for them. Right. Um, but I, again, this is a great recommendation. I agree with uh, Semelman Bryant. Great. OK, we'll move on unless there's any other questions. Um, so number two is um, another attempt to sort of uh, just leaven the, the harsh, harshness of a potential sentence after trial, and which is to take this default triad we have in the law. So if something, an offense says it's a felony, it doesn't specify the sentence in penal code section 18 and says in the sentence is, you know, 16, 24, 36 months. Analysis we've done shows this is about 70% of felony offenses use this triad. That's just offenses in the law, not necessarily what's actually charged and everything, but still a significant number. And so we'd say, well, let's add a presumption of probation as part of that triad. So you'd affect a large number of offenses and it would just sort of affect the starting place for the discussion of sentence um, after trial. It wouldn't, I think, necess necessarily have to be a strong presumption. It'd be something that could be overcome, um, you know, uh, in the interest of justice, but it would help sort of um, set the level for what might happen after trial a little bit. And with through one, you know, changing one penal code section, you'd, you'd affect a lot of potential offenses. Yeah, what would be the burden of proof on the prosecution to overcome the presumption? You know, I think leaving it um, just as the interest of, of justice, or we could specify it more, but I think it, it, it shouldn't be, um, you know, a strong presumption in favor. Let's, let's put it that way, just because of the number of offenses here. And the fact is, most people do get probation, I think, as we heard a little bit earlier today. So this is kind of almost aligning the penal code of practice a little bit more is how I think about it to some degree. And the current triad is um, 18, 16, 16, 24, 36, 36. I believe, right. which hasn't been changed since 1976, FYI. <laughs> is there any chance that we could reduce those numbers or is that kind of just? I mean, of course, but it becomes a little, um, you know, how do you decide what to reduce it to? Yeah. Um, I mean, but but you know, in current law, is that you're supposed to impose the lower the midterm unless there's aggravating factors that have been you know alleged and, and proven. Of course, there's some disputes about what those are. So, um, you know, we're talking two years or less is the sort of presumptive sentence for for most right. felonies. I I but, think we right. could, to answer your question, Mike, we could reduce the triad. It, it would be analogous to what happened with the length of probation when it went from two, three years to two, we just say one 
16 and 2 is the triad now. Um, right. I will, uh, I will, so, you know, maybe this will help us. So the way these triads were set originally was they looked at how long people were actually doing in prison and they tried to sort of fit it in. So most people fit. So it sort of reflected what people were doing in 1975. Um, and right. So, so how, how does that, could we do the same math now or is that just a huge project? Well, it's a little a snake eating its own tail because of, people are sentenced under a different triad then their sentences will have been different. We're right. going from an indeterminate system where okay. everyone was getting, good yeah. Point, good point, good point, good point. Yeah. Um, but there is some very, you know, how about could, it, it would take a while because <laughs> we could look at how many get the low, how many get the mid and the enhancements, everything complicated, a project we should do, but. Um, I, I would, so sort of piggybacking on Justice Moreno's question about the burden on the prosecution, I might adopt some of the um, ideas that we inserted into uh, 1385 about people with mental illness and people who are older or longer sentences, you know, some of those factors as, yeah. as mitigating. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think, I think I understand where this is going. And, and to me, this takes kind of a harm reduction approach. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of stomach gets a gets a feeling codifying probations or supervision supervision's role uh as an arm but i i definitely understand the benefits of that versus you know kind of formal caging in in a jail or prison uh but it's it's definitely interesting i think those mitigating factors make a lot of sense as well um what percentage of felonies fall under this 16 24 36 it's about 70 71 or 72 percent but that's just on the books. That includes, you know, business and profession code right. <laughs> that aren't real things. We don't know how many people it affects. It, it's seventy percent of all of the statutes. I, you know, we did some preliminary look at people in CDCR, and it was still a majority. It, it was less than seventy percent, but I think it was still more than fifty percent, which you'd expect given the, you know, more serious offenses in prison. So it, it, it th this is the biggest uh, return on investment in changing one penal <laughs> code section. Let me put it that way. Right. That's why I would love to reduce everything by six months. Just All right. OK, moving on to number three. So this is um, another, you know, these are all specific penal code sections. But right now there's a very common uh, firearm enhancement, the use enhancement that can add up to 10 years. Uh, and it says, OK, you should only use this for offenses that don't already have a firearm firearm as part of the offense, except if it's assault with a firearm. So you can essentially get punished twice for uh, using a gun, which is inconsistent with how, you know, other the criminal law is usually supposed to work. And it can really be, you know, it can more than double the punishment you get. So the assault with a firearm offense, which is very common, is a wobbler. And this, you know, if you this enhancement could add up to 10 years to that. And the reason we focused on this one is because we looked at the data on the folks who were in CDCR and had this combination of offense and enhancement. And it was about more than two thirds of the folks in CDCR uh, who had assault with the firearm also had the gun enhancement on top of it. So it just seems um, like a loophole uh, that should be closed um, and would again, remove some of the sort of unfair leverage that might be used in some of these cases to induce guilty pleas. Do we have any data on what the, um, you know, one of our recommendations was changing how the court would apply enhancements and that bill did pass and was signed into law. Do we have any data on whether that's impacted, for example, like this enhancement? The We started to look at that and it looks like the overall number of enhancements has sort of stayed the same. There's only looking at one year. And we also had the prior uh, enhancement reforms that, you know, were targeted to the nickel prior and some gun enhancements. So um, I think it's very early to say, but it's something that we're, we're figuring out ways to, to, to track. Um, but because that applied to so many different things, it's a little bit harder when looking at, you know, just the nickel prior, for example. Along, along those lines, um, and this is the same trick I was um, suggesting before, but could we add this to the list of this reasons to dismiss under 1385 instead of outright prohibiting it? 
Uh, yeah. I'm I mean, not my, sure. But, I'm, I'm sorry. Just, I always wonder with things like this, if there's any way to less directly <laughs> kind of in the use of enhancements that are essentially the same crime that you've you've been convicted of with without specifying you know this clearly what this is because this would be a, a nightmare of good policy mm-hmm. but political a political firestorm mike's approach would would be one way um, yeah that's what i was trying to get at and saying that 1385 would allow a judge to to use the enhancement if they determine that there's a public safety justification for it but they'd have to go through that who Central. I mean, we'd still be looking at a bill that specifically referenced, you know, these penal code sections. So I wonder if, yes, we can we can definitely take that approach. But, um, you know, that's the problem. If this enhancement has a particular exception that would have to be addressed. So I think it's um, hard to do that without specificity. Well, I think but sure, we- if it isn't a wholesale thing, maybe that makes it easier too. if it is a discretionary um uh, is there a way to say, uh, again, using 1385, enhancements that are included in the offense or seem to be double count, you know, to get to this double counting idea rather than singling out the firearm case in particular? Because there's probably other examples of that as well. I I think that is sort of the general, I, I want to refresh my recollection, but that is the sort of general rule of court with um, enhancements that you're not supposed to double count. Um, and this one sort of has a specific exception. So I don't know how many others there are, but, but certainly that would be a more general approach. Well, we're currently doubling counting with the nickel priors and the one, I guess the one year priors are gone and second strikes. And I mean, like that's double counting. Yeah. Though there's always exceptions for prior conviction enhancements compared to the, uh, yeah, I I hear what you're saying. Eliminating them altogether, but I'm saying that this is another. Yeah. Just a suggestion. Tom, um, refresh my recollection, but aren't the enhancements for, I mean, the the, the different enhancements the, of time apply to like if someone was injured, if the gun was discharged, if the gun was simply brandished or displayed or was armed? That that That's mostly a different set of gun enhancements. That sounds like the 1020 life enhancements that can only be applied to violent offenses. So this is, a, okay. this one can be applied to any felony. Um, but there, but there is, of course, a separate injury enhancement you could get in addition to this, which it would is. add three years. So mm-hmm. there's lots of stuff on the menu. It's just this combo seemed um, not to make much sense. Is there a way to have assault with a firearm that doesn't include use? Or does it include, does it capture every case? I, is there, I mean, I'm sure we could come up with a hypothetical. I just can't imagine it has any come something that comes up in real life too much what do you think rick he's he's good at thinking of those <laughs> um i don't know something that comes to mind is a co-defendant situation where two people are charged with assault with a firearm one person had the firearm uh but it like tom said this is kind of coming it, it sounded like a law school hypothetical at that, at that point it seems like in most scenarios you if you assaulted a person with a firearm the use uh enhancement would apply to you and just so we're clear, assault with a firearm does not necessarily mean firing a firearm at anybody or even right. pointing at them, right? Yes. Right, right. That's why it's such a common offense. Right. Well, the 1385 versus the standalone a- approach, um, I mean, easy enough for us to write it either way. I mean, it's sort of the same um, argument, I think. Um, but perhaps the 1385 approach would, would um, you know, apply to more than just the situation where the same problem is happening with other enhancements that are also sort of double counting effect. I mean, so we'll is, it, it. is it simple assault and then the great bodily injury enhancement? Doesn't that double count? Not necessarily, because it has to be great bodily injury, which is not um, necessarily what happens with an assault. So that's the idea. If you have an assault and if you there is more than sort of what requires there, you you get extra time for that. All right. 
So, so we'll, we'll, we'll try the 1385 approach and maybe we'll use this as an example uh, for where that might apply. Um, and then if we need to adjust that, easy enough to do, I think. Okay, and the last one, we sort of already spoke about this. This is the lesser related offenses. So this is this idea of, of juries are often given a very stark all or nothing choice on what to convict of when there might be a, an offense that's not as serious that the facts actually show. Again, burglary versus trespassing. Under current law, this very formal, rigid way of interpreting it, you wouldn't get to instruct the jury on trespassing. They wouldn't have an opportunity to convict, so they'd often be left with what you either can guilty of burglary or nothing. And um, a concern there that someone might have, well, they're gonna definitely convict me of burglary, even though that's not what happened. So I'll, I'll plead guilty to something in between. So um, this proposal would be to bring back lesser related offenses and, and specify what is a lesser related of what. Um, so, you know, brandishing a weapon, lesser related of, a, of assault and, you know, three or four things like that. And again, this was something that was uh, permissible in California for about 14, 15 years until the California Supreme Court reversed its own decision on it in 1998. And saying what? Saying you defendant doesn't have a right to request this anymore in any circumstance. So what? there was a bill that did yes. this a few years ago. Lee carried it for California safety and justice. Did that bill not make it? It did not make it. Uh, I think. I think it didn't make it past the appropriations if I remember. Mine or maybe my, no on the floor. I didn't make it on the floor. Sorry. Gotcha. My only concern with with this is um the all or nothing can favor defendants if overzealous DAs, you know, I've got a um, a right. relative by extension who was charged with, you know, depraved heart uh murder in Colorado and like it, it was a vehicular manslaughter mm -hmm. and um, it's still terrible and horrible um, and the lessers ended up being included and so it got played down but in that case you know this is almost like a backstop for DAs to always shoot for the moon isn't it well unless you make it it's at the defense defendant's request so that it would be their their option which is how the policy was uh, in the 80s and 90s when we had it gotcha that's how you would address that. I think I like it. I think it's tough that it didn't get very far in the legislature, you know, not that long ago. You know, there can be different reasons for that, but yeah, that that's true. <laughs> well, well said, Tom. <laughs> that don't necessarily go to the, uh, you know, what would happen again, but okay. sometimes they do. All right, let's keep it for now. And you know, it's a very technical one that, um, but I think is gives a good tool to a defense attorney. So that's it. Um, so I think we've got good direction. We'll essentially write up all the guilty Wait, is that ones it for, today? for the discussion of the topics today. Then we'll go very quickly through what we covered last time with there's Rick a, and Joy. There's a couple of things that I wanted to just bring up that I thought were interesting. And well, maybe just one was um, the suggestion, I think, from Alex Chillis Wood about the uh, early dis the decisions on early dismissals. I thought it resonated well with our early right. council idea. Um, and it could be an incentive program or it could not be just say that for certain offenses and depending how refined we want it to be, that DAs were either given more money to do it. I, I would, I guess I make a parallel with the public defender proposal. Yeah, we were thinking of that as a sort of part of the um, incentive idea, but you know, it could be a standalone program. Well, yeah, I guess with the incentive idea, I mean, we should all talk about it. I think that we need to refine those to a little bit more specific mm -hmm. we're talking about. Maybe we just can put that in that converse, in that boat of conversation. Sure. All right. Anything else before we turn back the clock a little bit? No. Go back right. to the feedback machine. <laughs> Way back to June. So Rick, Rick is going to take over, then we'll, and then Joy will will finish things up, and we'll we'll try to get through these as quickly as we can because it's been a long day. Um, so yeah, I'll, we'll definitely try to move quickly, but of course there are more details in the staff memo, and like Tom said, if there are any questions, please feel free to interrupt. So I'll go over the staff proposals from our June meeting, which covered issues related to poverty and criminal law, and I'll jump right in with the first. 
uh, proposal, which is to focus welfare fraud prosecutions on the most serious cases and to do so by directing cases to the existing administrative process, unless there's clear evidence of intentional fraud. Just to jog everyone's memory, we heard uh, from our witnesses at the uh, June meeting that many people are swept into the criminal process um, because they uh, there are these complicated reporting comp uh, requirements that are difficult for people to keep up with and that people who make a mistake on a form or are confused can be swept into the criminal process. We looked at the statistics and saw some significant uh, race and gender disparities. It was mainly women of color who were arrested and convicted of this crime. And we also saw that most people uh, who are convicted of this crime, the vast majority, in fact, um, do not have any prior criminal record. So the specific uh, recommendation here would be to limit welfare fraud prosecutions to cases involving multiple counties. That's when a person fraudulently applies for benefits in two counties. Um, number two, uses stolen or fake identities. Or number three, traffics in benefits by unlawfully buying or selling them. The first three bullets are already in current law. And so we're not recommending any changes there. The big change here is uh, number four, because uh, under current law, any amount of welfare fraud can be prosecuted. Um, but there is a $950 threshold for charging felony cases. Um, and we heard that that $950, that could be less than one month of benefits for people. So the intention here is to focus on uh, cases of sustained fraud over a large period of time. That's how you kind of identify the more serious cases. And so the idea would be to only allow welfare fraud prosecutions in the first three instances or when they're the amount of uh, fraudulent benefits received is excessive. And we don't specify a specific number um, of what excessive means here. Uh, we've done a lot of work behind the scenes to figure out what that number would be. And I think we've kind of um, settled in that, you know, maybe the committee doesn't need to exactly recommend the, the exact number of what excessive means, but uh, perhaps the committee could say that it should be significantly higher than the current $950. Uh, in order to prosecute, mm -hmm. and that if a uh, legislator were to pick up uh, this uh, this recommendation and turn it into the bill, that they could continue to do work with uh, Department of Social right. Services and other advocacy groups to figure out what exactly that amount is. I, I would prefer us to, I mean, in the best case scenario, to come up with a number that had some rational sense, whether or not we discussed with those uh, stakeholders or whether or not we looked to other statutes that had triggering numbers that we said, well, you know, in this type of crime, we wait till this number. I don't know if we can do that, but. Well, I think part of part of the, if I remember our meetings here correctly, it was that, you know, for a family of four or a, a larger family, the benefits could be higher. Is there any way to tie it to kind of the, the monthly household allocation um, or, or, or benefits, expected benefits, so that it's a, a variable scale based on what you would expect yes. to receive? six months of benefits or some number like that. But I'd be curious, you know, is the art threat there thresholds for tax evasion or whatever? Is, what's the number that ticks it out? You know, why Good point. would we treat white defendants differently from black? I mean, it just seems like that's what we're talking about. That's amazing, Mr. Chair. I, lo I love that. <laughs> Senator Skinner, did you have something to say as well? I saw your um, I'm imagining that maybe Western Center on Law and Poverty or another um, entity has looked at this and we might want to, uh, you know, see if they have and get some information from them. Yes, we have been in talks with them. We, we, I think they, you know, that this is the, the, the issue here is that any kind of number that you throw out can ring as, as a bit arbitrary, but I think in a certain sense, you can tie it to, you could be creative in saying, you know, equivalent to one year of benefits for a person. Um, I, th that's something that we could certainly look into. And just a, the final point here uh, is kind of the catch-all prosecution is otherwise required by federal law. Just to, just to remind everyone that federal law doesn't require prosecution uh, currently. It requires that states do something to address welfare fraud, whether it be the administrative process or a criminal process, and it leads it to states. But if there were some federal requirement that states prosecute, then obviously uh, the state would adhere to that. 
So it could be that to take it out of being a crime and make it more a debt. Correct. So more a civil. I think that should be included in as one of the possibilities. Right. And, and that, I think the, the current administrative process is if a person is sent to the administrative process and not the criminal process, they will always have to pay the money back. Uh, and then there are other penalties, including, you know, suspension of benefits if the person intentionally committed fraud. But that process is already in place to repay the debt. Mm -hmm. okay. That's what the administrative process basically is, correct? Right. Correct. Right. Okay, moving on to our second proposal here is to reduce the scope of criminal fines and fees. And the proposal is to do that by eliminating add-on charges in all circumstances. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. And I, but, I'm sorry to no, go ahead. I unfortunately have to leave the um, our meeting now, um, but I'm happy to in, uh, separately um, give some input to our staff about these. Great. And we'll be in touch with you and your staff. Thank you, Sunday. Thanks. Thank you. Um, sorry. So I'll, I'll talk more about the add-on charges in just a moment, um, but it's the proposal would be to eliminate add-on charges in all circumstances. Next would be to prohibit uh, courts from issuing fines in misdemeanor, misdemeanor or felony cases if the person is indigent. And we'll have a little bit more details about that as well. And then in, in cases where a person is not indigent, to provide more guidance to court on what exactly the fine can be. Because right now for misdemeanors, it's zero to $1,000. There's no guidance on how judges should set that. For felonies, it's up to $10,000. And again, there's no guidance. So I just, uh, just you know, go ahead. can you go back a second before we get into this? Oh, sure. So there's fines, fees, and what are the different buckets of money? Fines and fees, Is, are those the only buckets? Yeah, we're we're calling them add-on charges, fines and add-on charges. So fines are the are what are set by a judge in court as punishment for a crime. They're set by statute saying for misdemeanors it's zero to a thousand bucks, felonies is up to a, uh, ten thousand. The, the fee, the add-on charges are all these other fees that get tacked on to the fine. They're not judges don't have discretion to set them. They're they're set by statute and they're. They're tacked on to people who are ordered to pay fines. And I remember we heard from Washington, from Washington State, they eliminated what for indigent folks? They eliminated um, add-on fees and they made uh, a provision. They have a provision that if a person is indigent, then any discretionary fine that a court can issue. So the court have, has discretion to issue a fine if a person is convicted of a crime. But if a person is indigent, then they uh, courts cannot issue fines. So for indigent people, it eliminated both fines and fees. Right. Okay. Right. I, I support doing that here. Okay. Well, that's uh, what this is, is based on for the right. most part. It's very similar to that. I understand. I just, why not be clean about it and just say that? What would you change? Let's just make a statute say we are eliminating fines and fees as people who are indigent. Well, because I think uh, then you would still have all these fees for folks who are not indigent that still don't make sense or just barely not indigent. So we're saying get rid of all those. And then if you're indigent, no fine. And then for the folks who make sense to pay a fine, here's here's how you handle that court. So I think I think we're essentially doing that. Okay. We'll we'll move ahead, Mike. And if there's if it jogs more discussion, we'll we're happy to continue that. But here, this this uh, slide here just is a reminder of the add-on charges. It shows that you know if the base fine for a misdemeanor is set at a thousand dollars, and a court orders a person to pay a thousand dollars upon being convicted of a misdemeanor, in fact, they're probably going to leave walk out of court with over four thousand dollars in debt because of all the add-on fees. And so what the court orders in court is not what the person is actually ends up required to pay. And so that's why we're saying eliminate all the add-on fees just to get to the details. Number one is to eliminate the add-on fees so that in, when the court sets a fee, in, a fine in court, that is the amount that the person has to pay. I, I think this is brilliant. I run the bill right now. We just did this for Ticketmaster and, you know, all in pricing for, 
for your concert tickets. So the price that they're putting on is the price you actually pay. There's no reason we shouldn't apply that same conceptual thinking to the criminal legal system. The the fee you've been set is the fee you've been set. Right. Exactly. But why, why, uh, I'm still like, let's just zero it out. It's ridiculous. We're not collecting the money. Well, not Mike, so, so, sometimes a, a fine um, makes sense for, for people. Like, you know, if Chevron pollutes, a fine no, probably I makes appreciate sense. For indigent so. folks. I'm just saying, let's like keep it simple. My argument would be to keep it, keep it simple. Worry about the indigent people, which is the vast majority of people that we're talking about in the system. And it's eliminated. Well, I think maybe if we if we look at number two, I, I think that's what it what it does, because number two is to say courts don't impose fine if the person is indigent. No, I understand how we get there. It just seems like a, a little bit of a convoluted way of doing it. I would just say that the top fines and fees are eliminated, period, full stop for indigent people if you qualify for a public defender. That's it, period. But, but then you're left in the penal code and other codes of all these fees that would apply to the folks who aren't indigent. So this actually simplifies things greatly by saying, get rid of the add-ons, get rid of the ticket master charges, and let's just focus on the fine, which is what the punishment is supposed to be. And then we're actually not going to do that for a lot of people. And then we're just left with the small number of cases where a fine makes sense. So it ends up being a much simpler approach. Um, and that's why we sort of structure it this way. Because if you just eliminated the, the add-on charges to indigent people, then what do you do for the folks who aren't indigent? You still have that big long list of stuff that, that Rick just showed. So there's a lot of complexity left over. But if that's the approach you all want to take, absolutely, we can oh, do no, that. I defer to you. I just... Go ahead. Yeah. Well, so again, the second point is to say, tell the courts not to impose a fine if the person is indigent. Um, defining indigency uh, as receiving public benefits, earning 125% or less of the federal poverty standard or represented by a public defender. And just noting that the first two uh, bullets there, courts are already using those bullets in traffic court because the uh, rules of court direct courts in setting traffic fines to consider whether the person is receiving public benefits or earning 125% or less of the federal poverty standard. Number three, represented by a public defender, um, that's what we heard from Representative Sin Simmons from Washington. Um, so we added it here as well. And then for the remaining cases, so if a person is not found to be indigent, we still are getting rid of the add-on fees for that person. So the amount that the court sets in a fine is what they have to pay, but telling courts to conduct an ability to pay determination uh, so that within that range, that zero to $10,000 for felonies or zero to $1,000 for misdemeanors, that courts should set fines in amounts compatible with the person's financial ab uh, ability. That leaves a lot of discretion for courts to decide what that is. And again, that specific language is taken from what's currently in the rules of court regarding setting traffic uh, fines. So this is something that judges should be familiar with. Um, yeah. Is there a reason that we should, especially when you consider the finance, the ability to pay, and I don't want to open a Pandora's box, but $10,000 to Chevron is nothing. Should that number be up in certain circumstances? The actual fines authorized in law, you mean? Yeah. I mean, really take the Norwegian model <laughs> and stretch it. <laughs> Three days of profits. Um, I'm, seri I'm serious. I mean, like, yeah. it's ridiculous. Uh, I, you know, it's I did. Aggressive. It's it's just it's it's the same. Right. Well, you know, I, I think we did, in... did look around in the penal code for for fine amounts, and we did see some, you know, some even higher fine amounts for specific offenses. You know, uh, poaching abalone is will get you a very steep fine, right? Uh, there wasn't anything that kind of rung true about the a uh, 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 steep fine for Chevron. Um, but I think there are some higher fine amounts. And I think, you know, there are specific offenses that already have them set pretty high, uh, maybe even above the $10,000. I I would I would be interested, and maybe this isn't the right vehicle to talk about it, but fines that are sufficient to deter the behavior for, you know, corporate, you know, for certain defendants. That's I think that's a project that's a little bit distinct from from this one, um, especially for the corporate defendants. There's often going to be civil liability, you know, from the attorney general or other folks. So it's it's um, that's something we can look at. I think it'll take up a 
a couple of resource, you know, too much resources to All do right. uh, this That's period of time. But I, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll move on to the third uh, proposal here, and that's to expand law enforcement assisted diversion or lead. Um, and we would do that by funding additional lead pilots. We heard about the lead pilots uh, that were launched in 2016 in San Francisco and LA and how successful they were, but that the pilot funding has since um, expired and that the momentum built for lead may have kind of waned through the COVID period. So the proposal would be to fund additional lead pilots and then the second part of it would be to update the penal code to encourage officers to use uh, community-based, to divert people to uh, community-based services in lieu of arrest in more circumstances. That's even in uh, for agencies and in jurisdictions that don't have an official lead program to put something in the penal code that says, hey, you can do this uh, even if you don't have a lead program. So just getting to the details here. Number one is to reestablish the lead pilots with the following specifications. And the first bullet is about eligible offenses. If you remember, the, the first lead pilot was focused on drug offenses and offenses related to prostitution. And those were the offenses eligible for, for lead. But what we heard from our panelists were that for the people that are targeted for lead, these are the frequent utilizers, people who are frequently arrested. They're not always just arrested for drugs and prostitution. There's also offenses related to theft, burglary, and trespassing. And so the recommendation uh, here would be to expand the list of eligible offenses to still include the drugs and the prostitution, but also those related to theft, burglary, and trespassing. We have stats showing that these are some of the most frequent misdemeanor arrests um, uh, yearly. But then the second bullet is to allow counties to even further expand that list of eligible offenses. So if you're in a county that uh, wants to take on, you know, low level, you know, possession of a knife or, uh, you know, some other offense that isn't included here, if, if that uh, is an offense that your county wants to target, counties should be able to expand that list. And then the second uh, detail here is to update Penal Code Section 849, which already exists in the Penal Code, and it allows officers to divert, uh, to uh, instead of processing an arrest to take somebody who's arrested for being under the influence to a hospital. And uh, this is just kind of uh, expanding on an idea that we heard from uh, Captain Diedrich of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. He said that, you know, if we put something in the penal code that gives officers more guide rails for doing this, then they'll be more likely to do it. And so to ex expand penal code section 849 and, and tell police officers in every agency, whether they have a a lead program or not, that if you arrest uh, a person for this for low level offenses and you want to refer them to a community based supportive services, then you can do that. And we think that that would empower officers to do more pre booking diversion. Is there something that we can do that's allow that's more than just allow? Um, you know, I don't know. I'm thinking about some of the incentive stuff that we were talking about, or presume for certain offenses that they go unless they have to make some public safety determination. Maybe it's putting in some of the bureaucratic bur barriers that Doliac suggested. So you have to give a just written justification why you're not doing it. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I think in terms of the in incentivizing it, I think that's funding the pilots because counties ha would have to opt in and say, yes, we want to do this. No, and I, that incentivizes it. No, I understand the lead part. I'm talking about number two. So the way the law is written is you're presumptively not supposed to arrest uh, in these circumstances. Um, but I think the problem is take them to where, you know, if you create a presumption that you're going to take them somewhere, um, it puts a lot of pressure on where those places are that may not make sense. Um, and I also think there's like a, a very delicate balance when we were speaking to people about law enforcement assistance aversion there, you know, police agencies don't want their hand forced into doing this. They want to buy in is actually very important. And, you know, this is something that the state wants police officers and agencies to do. And I think that's why the incentivizing it may work. But the presumption, uh, you know, people were very cautious about a presumption to require police officers not to do this. I'm 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 with you, Mike. But uh, I think I think Rick and Tom might be on to just kind of taking this a step by step. I mean, I can, you know, just seeing these recommendations, I have a, a lot of thoughts about the funding of lead um, pilots and just how we, if we, and how we do that. But in terms of the updating the penal code, 
I can see lead officers testifying in a public safety committee alongside somebody like me in a very rare moment of us saying the same thing. Uh, if if we leave it open like this, uh, and if there's a need from the data to kind of more specifically require um, certain diversions to community-based supportive services, I think that's a step, you know, another step down the road. Um, but I think if, if the penal code isn't clear that this is an option that folks can do, um, and so there's kind of this preemption curiosity in local jurisdictions where they're blaming the penal code for not doing it, I think it's important that we clarify that. No, and I and I, I I agree, and I remember the testimony from I forget whom that's saying that just by giving I think Rick said the guardrails or the the directions on how to do this I think does open up some opportunities. I just like to push it even further. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. But we also just heard you know the San Francisco experience. While you know on paper the statistics showed the recidivism was uh, rearrests were less for people who participated in the program. The program ultimately ended because there was just a lack of buy-in from the police officers and there was that tension. I know, so the, current, the current chief just got on TV and said that he wants right. more. So, right. 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 Hey, Mike, I've got to sign off. I've got a four o'clock that I've got to get ready for on a university presidential search. So I'll just look forward to the recommendations, but I agree with everything that uh, Rick has presented. Thanks. Should I send you my resume? Is that what you're telling me I should do? Uh, I think there's a vacancy. The okay. deanship and the president of Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. So send me your resume. I'm serious. UCLA needs a chancellor too. You're welcome down here, Mike. <laughs> that sound like hard jobs. <laughs> okay. You get a nice well, house though at Stanford at least. <laughs> All right. And that's it, right, Rick? Yeah, that's it. Okay. We're almost done. Thanks for hanging in there, folks. Uh, all right, I'll just jump into this pretty quickly. Um, Rick, you can put on the next slide. So I just wanted to, before our next meeting that we'll all get together is we will be talking about the proposals for the final report. So just before that happens, I just wanted to refresh your memory quickly about the recommendations that came from our March meeting that we discussed in June. So happy to discuss any of this in detail, but I'll just go through it quickly. We came up with five um, proposals out of that meeting. The first was to create general resentencing procedures. And we've sort of started numbering these number four, given that you know likely the three proposals from the last meeting would be included. The second or number five rather would be um, judges now have the ability to exercise discretion to dismiss the nickel prior. So this would just be updating that so people in prison currently serving a sentence uh, would also have that chance. I just need to make sure that I weigh in strongly on this one. This is this would be a major, major reform. It mirrors what we did with um, the one year prison priors. It has had an incredible amount of effect in terms of resentencing people. The nickel priors are, are, even, are a bigger problem in many ways. And uh, I know a lot of judges and folks would love to get their chance on resentencing people based on nickel priors. It's already being done by large part by CDCR, but this would be the better, much better way to do it. Um, it makes perfect sense in terms of equity. If you're convicted today, then you get the opportunity to argue that you shouldn't have the nickel prior. If we do one thing, this is it for me. Go ahead. Absolutely. And the next one would be to clarify that SB 81's, um, that the updates to Section 1385 would apply to strikes. The uh, number seven would be revisiting the recommendation from our inaugural report in 2020 um, to expand second look sentencing for anybody who's uh, served more than 15 years. And the last one we had discussed was improving data access um, for people that are litigating Racial Justice Act claims to really give some meaning to that uh, statute. And then, of course, as you know, in last year, we our report will also include continued um, analysis of offenses that don't often result in arrest or conviction. It turns out and to be a surprisingly seven, high number. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for number seven, I would suggest that we find some way to piggyback onto uh, AB 600, assuming that gets signed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good place to yeah, start. Good. Also, is there, you know, just outside of the recommendations, I'm thinking about all the incredible data and work that's done here. Um, 
including that last point, um, I, I, I'm going to just guess that many of the offenses that rarely result in arrest or conviction might be things that we watch high profile videos on these days. Um, but do we share this work ever in a public way? Is that shunned? Is that <laughs> discouraged? Um, just in terms of like, do we, you know, is there a, a releasing of the report that happens where, where findings are discussed and information is shared? You don't know, you don't, you don't see the hour long television <laughs> specials that we have on our released reports and celebrities <laughs> come out and the, the short answer is, you know, they're, they're in our PDF. So however it can be amplified is, is, is great. But, um, yeah, it's it's definitely not sort of um, I guess my team's strength is, is figuring how to how to get the word out a, a, around that stuff. But it's all it's all out there. We try to make it as approachable as, as possible. Um, and we do, do do standalone reports of the California Policy Lab, and we're trying to increase the uh, volume of those by making them shorter. So I just think we're in a yeah. we're in a narrative battle, but we're fighting with data and evidence, mm -hmm. and that should be one of the most salient to use the word of the day um sources of information both for my colleagues but also the general public and so it would be a shame for this this kind of year-long effort multi-year effort not to to have some sort of platform of visibility uh and coverage for people to to really know I, I totally agree i think our website could be improved i think that we have all these charts and data that live in our reports that you have to kind of crack open and whatever i think there are better ways to this to display the work that we already have done. And we should think about that um, moving forward. You know, perhaps I've been kind of waiting on our sort of data portal that we've been, I've been alluding to and we've been talking about, but perhaps we should do it ahead of time and think of ways um, to do that, even if we have to raise money to get a fancier website. It all, the short an the answer is the data, the charts and information does exist on our website, but it, you have to go look for it. You have to know that you're going for it. And something member Brian, very, you know, something we're talk, starting to talk about just with my team is how to, um, you know, make more connections and, and be a real resource to to your colleagues and, and their staff. Um, so any thoughts you or your, or your your folks have about that? We're, we're super interested in that. I want to try to be more proactive because um, when yeah. we have done those things, there's been a great appetite for, I think a lot of data that that in this group we take for granted and should um, sort of be just, you know, what everybody knows about these issues. Yeah. And it's late. It's late this year. So maybe something to think about last yeah. year is other committees that my colleagues rely on for recommendations. Right. I think there's a I don't know, an abortion council or something like that, that the Women's Caucus relies very heavily in the same way that many of us rely on the work of this committee and to the way any any ways that there's intersecting issues for for recommendations to be cross collaborative, um, yeah. it might give you an opportunity to speak with folks in a way that um, they don't currently know who you are, even though they desperately should. I would also say, Assembly Member Brian, we're happy to do, or we staff is happy to do, and I think that we as a committee want to be a resource to individual lawmakers. If they might have questions, don't apply statewide. What's going on in my county? What's going? We have a lot of this information, and we're happy to provide it. Well, I love uh, the word because you you all are phenomenal and, and I've you know always appreciated the work, but now having done a full full year together, um, or cr creeping up on a full year, I, I appreciate it even more. Thank you. All right. Well, we have some so yeah, but just to close the loop. So our next meeting, which will be uh sometime middle end of next month, we're gonna have a draft of the report for you all to you know go through and give us revisions as appropriate. Um, but that's sort of the next thing. So it won't be panelists and, and all that. It should be a, a shorter meeting. That, that's up to you all, um, but that's the idea. And Tom, consistent with all the relevant statutes, I think that there are some proposals that need to be ironed out with some individual members that I hope that you can circle back with. Uh, and I'm happy, yeah. and I would more than happy, I'd love to participate to the extent that I'm legally permitted to. Of course, yeah, we will do. All right. Um, I'd like to take a five minute break before doing public comment, but maybe I will just say this and maybe when people line up and then we'll take then we'll take the break. How about that? Um, so we've reached the time for public comment. Thank you all for sticking with us. For those li listening live via Zoom to get in line to comment, please select the raise hand function in Zoom. If you're calling in, you can hit star nine. Um, 
Please note that this meeting is being recorded, and if you make a public comment, your name and phone number may be displayed as part of the recording. We're going to take five minutes now, see how many people want to comment, and based on that, I'll see how long each person has to comment. Please note that the committee also accepts written comment and, uh, uh, by email. In fact, we prefer it in many ways, and that comment can be made uh, to the committee staff whose emails are on the committee website. With that said, I'd like to take a five-minute break. We'll reconvene at four o'clock to hear public comment. Thank you all, and I'll see you in a minute. All right, people could come back.
when I get started, Mike? Yeah, let me just try to pull up the list. Um, we have uh, three folks at the moment. Sounds like it's right. All right, great. We'll spend two minutes on each. Um, Crispy, we'll hear from you first. Hi, Mike, if you'll indulge me, I'm speaking for actually four people who are incarcerated plus me, that'll be like four minutes altogether. Is that okay? Yeah, Christy, I, it, it, it is. I heard that you were uh, suggesting that through Tom. Just let me say a couple of things in advance. I, I, we, I, I very much appreciate, first of all, that you read these letters from folks inside, and I hope that you report back that we really do listen and take it seriously. Um, we can't promise you that this will be available at every uh, meeting. Also, please know that I think that we've said this multiple times, but Tom and I were just talking about it uh, earlier today about how we want to have a serious session one way or another inside prison walls at some point now that the pandemic is well behind us. Um, so the short answer is yes today, not necessarily for every meeting. Um, and we do really appreciate uh, what you're doing. So why don't you start for me? Well, I appreciate that. And I know that all these guys and people inside appreciate it and would love to talk to you guys. So I'm Crispy, survivor of harm. Uh, Dortel Williams from Chuckawalla uh, Valley State Prison serving Elwa. I have a comment for discussion number three, California's use of incentives in the criminal legal system. The problem with corrections is the stick and punishment do not teach people new skills or help replace warped perspectives or character liabilities. Incentives do all of the above and lessen reliance of physical and other force. Most criminally, most criminality is rooted in the thinking and punishment doesn't address that true public safety is founded on a system that teaches cognitive new and positive ways to approach life and its challenges. From Jasper Stallings, Valley State Prison, serving 127 years. The district attorney makes these deals mostly with the public defenders to raise conviction rates, mostly on poor minorities who seemingly unknowing of the laws. And it's not making the streets safer by these policies that seems to only benefit the district attorney's office. When you offer someone something under the rows that it can always be worse and essentially scare people into taking the deal. Plus that it's obvious that most fall into that thinking, into that taking a deal without fully knowing. At the same time, keeping the face of the families intact. That's not fair, especially when in the county jail with no real access to the law library. Eric Phillips San Quentin Rehabilitation Center. The California Penal Code needs a serious revision. One of the issues is the voluminous amount of enhancements when these people criticize and threaten to recall DA Pamela Price based on her not charging enhancements, it shows they have no idea how the criminal justice system works. Enhancements are tough on crime posturing, which do things like add many years to what could already be a 25 to life sentence. This is overkill. They also find all kinds of situations, including suspected gang involvement to add enhancements and they disproportionately affect black and brown people as Ms. Price stated. Ronald Montez, California Men's Count men's colony. I am very interested in the plea bargain issues. That is a much needed overdue discussion. We as defendants plea to things we are not guilty of, but desperate to bring relief to the horrific stresses of being locked down 20 to 22 hours a day in our cells and our attorneys leaving us in the county jail for years without coming to visit us and telling us what they're doing after paying them 20000 to $70,000. Not to mention, they don't explain the plea deal to you nor do they tell you that you will be in slavery and will be tried again in a BPH hearing with four judges and the victim's family. All plea deals need to be recalled in cases tried over. And this is from me. Plea deals are a poor answer to the overwhelmed courts and are detrimental to public safety, extend sentences and violate human rights. We should move towards a system of restorative justice and diversion programs retro retroactively and prospectively remove sentence enhancements, and commute sentences more frequently. I would like to uplift that on September 28th, 2023, just last week, the United Nations issued a report calling on the United States to end death by incarceration sentences. In particular, the report says, disproportionate, excessive, and discriminatory sentencing beyond life expectancy is a cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment in violation of international human rights standards protecting life liberty and end against torture. All prison sentences in the United States 
should include parole eligibility within a reasonable number of years and always and always below life expectancy. Federal and state executive branches should, should keep exercising clemency powers in favor of persons already serving sentences beyond life expectancy, especially benefiting children and persons who committed crimes when they were children and older persons. I would also like to uplift that 263 people incarcerated in California state prisons have died of COVID and that prisons are once again going on lockdown because of the virus. So we urgently need to reduce the prison population and free people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Crispy. As always, I appreciate your comments and please uh, extend the word back to the folks that you read those letters that we uh, we appreciate their input as well. Um, Jinx. Marion Wigard. Two minutes, please. Hi, guys. Thanks. Hey, from the first panel today, Shima stated that most of the people incarcerated are violent. I do not agree whatsoever with her. Many may have committed a violent crime, but humans are not their crime. They are all still people. Thank you, Michael, for disagreeing with her. I truly appreciate that. Taking responsibility for your crime and accepting a plea bargain, which Tommy did prior to prelim with a fourth grade education, Tommy is transformed into a highly respected man, not just by the incarcerated, but the San Quentin staff all the way up the ladder to CDCR headquarters and California government. However, Tommy is not afforded the ability to go to board the same as lifers because he accepted an outrageous plea bargain. If he would have went to trial, he possibly would have received a life sentence. So, of course, he felt accepting a plea bargain was a bargain. Tommy's sentence is 11 years with 46 years of enhancements. He will be 86 years old when he gets out, a transformed man stuck inside because he took responsibility for his crime. Outrageous plea bargains are barbaric. Of course, money is a big issue. If Tommy Wickard was freed, along with four and a half more men who are ready for society, the state would save $1 million in the first year alone. I would like to uplift the documentary 26.2 to Life, the San Quentin Prison Marathon, which provides insight into positive change made through rehabilitation and athleticism. Of the now more than 45 lifers who have been released from the film, the recidivism rate is zero. A documentary, <laughs> Shima, would greatly benefit from watching. I hope for those of you who have not seen the film, you will look it up and watch the trailer with anticipation to watch the film. The film screened at the Crest in Sacramento with a full house and has screened in theaters across the country with positive impact. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Um, thank you. Two things I just want to respond to that. First of all, I've had heard great things about the film, 26.2 uh, to life. I have not seen it yet, so I, it's on my queue. But also I just want to correct the record. I don't think that uh, Shima Badran um, Boffman was suggesting um, harsher treatment or anything to the, to the anything of the sort for folks committed of violent crimes. Um, how, I think that her point was that we should not omit people who've committed violent crimes from the reforms that we're um, considering, so. Thank you for clarifying that for me. That, not to put too fine a point on it, but I think that that's where she was coming from. Okay, thank you. And watch 26.2 to life. You guys will all appreciate it. Thank, thank you. And then, uh, Finally, G. Last but not least. Never. Hey all, um, big appreciation for your panels today and for all of you and all the work you do. Incredibly, in, huge amounts of extra love for assembly member Brian. I'm so grateful for your, your co-sponsorship for AB 280. Um, for the Home Act as well. Very heartbroken about uh, what's going on with both those bills, but I have faith that they will eventually make it forward in one iteration or another. Um, so it's wrongful conviction day. And um, although I'm an Amnesty International, I'm the state death penalty abolition coordinator for Amnesty in the state of California. I'm speaking um, for myself, Gabriela, AKA G. And I wanna lift up my dear friend, Kevin Cooper, wrongfully convicted, uh, Keith Zondulin, wrongfully convicted, Jarvis J. Masters, wrongfully convicted, uh, Chief Douglas, Chief Stankiewicz, uh, wrongfully convicted, all on San Quentin's death row. And so I appreciate 
and first of all, 26 to Life is incredible. Totally uplift. Marion, Tommy, Crispy, a producer on the film, amazing. But we have a little issue here. Where are folks going from San Quentin's death row? I'm not hearing it discussed. The regs haven't come out. I'm incredibly worried. Um, and I just want to know, Mike, <laughs> that you're worried too, or that you're working on something that is, as you're working on this quote, California dash Scandinavian model prison at San Quentin, that we're really considering and thinking about where 550 odd people are going across California and how they're going to, how their human rights are going to be monitored as they're dispersed willy nilly across California to various prisons. At least that's how I'm understanding it. Correct me if I'm wrong, or please um, let me know what you know, if you can. I think well, that ends. Yeah, so th that ends your time. I, I am watching this quite closely, and I'd be happy to chat with you offline about it. That would be great. Uh, my Just so you know, uh, my understanding is that they'll be returned to the general population just like everybody else. They'll have high classification scores, of course, but things that can be earned off. Um, I do not think that they will be treated specially or differently, and I think that that's probably the so, right. Sorry, I should have qualified this. So to which prisons? So it has to have a lethal electric fence. Um, I'm worried about which prisons will be available. Um, you know, I, I totally oh. respect the idea of closing prisons, but simultaneously we have a little issue here about where folks um, who don't have that option are going to go. We shouldn't. We shouldn't get to that here into that okay. here. I think they will be. I think that they will be treated relatively uh, equally compared to other folks incarcerated. Now the whole system needs uh, work, which is something that we are busy focusing on. Thank um, you. But I am 